Well, here we are again. We're with Jerry Friedman, who's um, one of our professors that taught Rob and I back in the, in the 80s when we were students at Stanford. At the time, Jerry was the director of the Computations Research Group at SLAC, which is the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And he, uh, he gave us uh, research assistantships up at SLAC, which was very good because they had great computers there. So Jerry um, is responsible for a lot of applied techniques, um, including some that we've used in the course, the cart trees, uh, some of the boosting models that we use were due to Jerry, and, uh, and also there's links to additive models. So it's very nice to have you here, Jerry. Well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I want to congratulate you on your course. Oh, you haven't seen it yet. But well, <laughs> I know it's it turns good. Out right. I know it's good. Um, so, Jerry, maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit about CART and how that came about. Oh, boy, how did CART come about? CART, uh, well, my part of CART came about in the early 70s, which shows you how old I am. I was uh, working with a fellow named John Bentley, who's a very well-known computer scientist, and he had developed a technique called KD trees to be used for computational geometry. And I was interested in using them for fast algorithms for finding near neighbors because I was interested in pattern recognition and learning. And near neighbors were a very popular technique at that time, especially after the Cover and Hart result about uh, one nearest neighbor contained half the information, which isn't quite true. But anyway, that's another, <laughs> that's another story. So I was uh, working on that with John. We developed some fast near neighbor algorithms and so on. Then I started to thinking, well, if you wanted to use the KD tree for finding nearest neighbors, maybe you might want to build it differently than if you just wanted to take advantage of the geometry. So I started thinking about how one would do that, that maybe you wanted to split on the informative classification variables, not just on, on those that had large spread. And after working that out for a while, it occurred to me that uh, you don't really need the nearest neighbors once you have the terminal buckets you can use those directly to classify. So that's how I got to it. And I wrote a couple of papers in the 70s about it. And then uh, it turns out at around the same time, Leo Bryman and Chuck Stone in Southern California were thinking along very similar lines. And so Richard Olshin got us together and we decided to write the joint monograph, merge our techniques into sort of one unified technique and then write a monograph about it because Leo didn't think that that time that any stat journal would ever publish anything about it. And there's never been a, a Ray Card paper published, isn't that right? No, the closest things there are are I, I published a card. I it wasn't called Card, but I published a couple of things in the IEEE journal, IEEE Transactions on Computers on Recursive Partitioning Ideas for Classification, and uh, uh, Leo. And Chuck Stone wrote several uh, tech reports at uh, Technology Service Corporation where they were consulting and developed, where they developed uh, their version of CART. Yeah, as usually is the case, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a good idea that other groups have it as well. So weren't people in computer science? Oh, we didn't invent the idea yeah. of trees, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, trees, well, people argue. The first instance in statistics was in the late 60s with Morgan and Sonquist and the people from the Michigan Social Science Institute. And trees got a very bad reputation because they didn't have cross-validation, they didn't have pruning, mm. and so they terribly overfit and they would re report the overfit result like you did in regression at that mm. time. And so they got a very bad reputation. And so when we published the book in 83 or 82, uh, it was generally looked down upon because of this uh, holdover uh, uh, antagonism of the statistics community to the uh, earlier development of trees. Trees were a good idea. They're not a good idea for very uh, small data sets with high noise to signal, which is what social science data is like and was certainly like then. And so trees don't work well in that context. Mm -hmm. And it was basically the computer scientists who really popularized trees. One of the things, uh, things I find unique about you, about you Jerry, is that you, I mean, you're a famous statistician, but you don't even have a degree in statistics. Your, your background is physics. That's right. So I, I never took a statistics <laughs> course ever. So as a result, you're very good at thinking outside the box, right? Because you're, you're 
So you haven't seen some of the box inside, so you're, uh, you're very, a very fresh way of thinking about problems. Feynman mentioned that in his book, Surely You're Joking. He says when people change fields, they often immediately make contributions because they have a, a different set of tools and talents and a different way of thinking. And that, that, that may be part of it, yes. And then, and then came, came boosting in 95. Yeah, that was, of course, as you well remember, that was Freud and Shapira, right. which uh, I, was a very good idea, which I didn't immediately appreciate. But uh, uh, it was a very good idea. And then I, I sought to generalize it. They had it for two-class classification. Right. And I sought to generalize it to general loss functions. And, uh, uh, regression and other kinds of learning rather than just do class classification. And that led to the whole gradient boosting thing. So trees are still important today, you'd say? That oh yeah, well first of all, a lot of people still use single trees mm -hmm. to analyze data. It's, it's one of the more popular techniques in data mining. Trees have really strong advantages for data mining, not so much for pattern recognition, but in situations where you have a lot of features that don't contribute, where the uh, have outliers, the data is dirty. Trees are the closest thing that we have where you can just kind of pour data in without cleaning it, without uh, teasing it, without going over it, and still hope to get a reasonable result. And boosting trees inherits all of that, but dramatically increases its accuracy. So that's why it intrigued me, although as I said in the beginning, I didn't think much about it. But uh, then we worked on it together and kind of figured out what it was doing. And it was clear it was doing something very intelligent. Well, back in the 80s was also the time when um, you came out with a technique called super smoother. Yeah. And there was projection pursuit regression with you and uh, Werner Stutzler. That's right. Um, and other projection pursuit work. And then ultimately um, the ACE algorithm and additive models with Leo Breiman. And so that actually started Rob and I and, and part of our career on additive models and smoothing. So you've had influences in, in, in those areas as well. Uh, yes, one of the nice things about uh, being old and having uh, grand students and great grand students and everything else is that you can uh, not only take pride in your own accomplishments, but you can take pride in the accomplishments of those that you may have influenced. And so I'm really proud of you guys. <laughs> well, we feel like, we feel like, uh, uh, Grand students, when we talk to our professors like Jerry and, and Brad, the thing that makes me feel old is that I've got grand students of my own now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, you can take pride in all of them. So, uh, Jerry, you've, you've retired. You retired about two years ago. But I don't think there's been a day when I haven't seen you in the office. Well, I'm not here every day, but I'm here a lot of the time, yeah. I, I'm retired like Leo Bryman was retired. And... Uh, and for a long time, Charles Stein was retired. He came in every day for a long, long time. And then Leo, many of his best accomplishments were after he retired, research accomplishments. But it seems the feel, you still feel excited by the field. And, and Oh, yeah. There's more to do. Definitely more to do. And, of course, uh, uh, very gratified that something that I was you know, intellectually interested in for all this time has now become very popular and very important. I mean, data has risen to the top. My only regret is two of my mentors, who, who also pushed it probably harder and more effectively than I did, namely John Tukey and Leo Bryman, are not around to actually see how data has triumphed you know, over, say, theorem proving. Um, one of the tools we teach in our class is the Glimnet package, um, which you'll all be using. And you'll, if you've appreciated how fast it is, here's the man who's responsible <laughs> for the speed. Jerry is one of the best programmers, um, in this case in Fortran, that, uh, that we've come across, and he knows how to write lightning fast code. Right, right. I mean, when we were developing the ideas for Glimmet, about once every, once every week or two, Jerry would come in our office and say, guys, I figured out a way to save a, a millisecond in this loop, right? And we'd go, Jer <laughs> Jerry, let's go back to your office and get your work done. Yeah, but but uh, when the program was done, we realized that uh, a small saving in a loop can make a huge difference in the final... That's right. They, they, they do count. Well, that I find is fun. It's kind of a hobby programming. I've been doing it for a very, very long time, since the late 60s, when there weren't many computers around, but I happened to be in fields that did have 
uh, high-speed computers. And I'm sure you program in C++ or Java? What do you? No, 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 no I can't teach old. Uh, I, uh, I, I do object-oriented programming, but I do it in the context of Fortran. You can do it. <laughs> There's an old saying that uh, a Fortran programmer can program any language in Fortran. <laughs> Okay. Well, David, great talking to you. We expect lots of nice things coming from, from keep, your office keep in up the near future. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good luck with your course. Thank you.